Welcome back to Walking Away from Arcadia. This is Simon, and before we get to today's conversation about queer themes and changeling the dreaming, we thought it'd be useful to briefly go over terms that may be unfamiliar to people not in the American queer community. If you're already familiar with these terms, you can probably skip this and move straight to episode 3.5, Queer Themes and Changeling the Dreaming, but you might want to listen anyway. These aren't meant to be universal or definitive, but they are the definitions that the people involved in the conversation reached consensus over. Straight refers to individuals who have, if you will, the default sexuality. Men who are attracted to women, women who are attracted to men. They generally are not considered part of the queer community, and their sexuality usually does not directly engage with any other queer identities. Bisexual individuals are those who are attracted to both genders, someone who is attracted to men and women. Not necessarily in equal measure, but they have a strong enough attraction to individuals of both genders to support a relatively regular sexual activity, attraction, pattern of relationships with individuals from both genders. Someone who is pansexual is someone who identifies gender as not being a limiting factor in attraction. They don't necessarily view their attraction as being along any kind of binary, I'm attracted to men and women lines. They view it in more fluid forms. Then there are gay or lesbian identities, homosexuals, gay men are men who are attracted to men, lesbian women are women who are attracted to women, So, in general, individuals who are attracted to the same gender. Queer is an interesting term in that it is often used to describe both sexual attraction and gender. It is a term that was originally a slur and has been picked up and reclaimed. It was originally, before it was a slur, towards homosexual individuals, bisexual individuals, trans individuals. It just meant anything that deviated from the norm. Uh, Its old definition was something was queer if it was odd, if it was unusual. In the current use within the LGBTQ community, there is generally an understanding that an individual who is queer is not just homosexual or not cisgendered, but an individual who is expressly pushing against whatever normal definitions are. Normal definitions in society broadly, and normal definitions often within the LGBT community. Someone who is queer embraces the fact that all of these limiting ideas about what a person is or isn't prevents them from exploring possibilities. Not everyone who identifies as queer picks that up, though. It's a somewhat ill-defined word, but that is uh, a common aspect for a lot of people who choose to use that word, although definitely not all. Next, we have terms relating to gender, gender performance, and gender perception. First, we have cisgender, or sometimes shortened to cis, This refers to people whose internal experience of their gender aligns with the gender they were assigned at birth or shortly after birth. This is a term largely used in academic and queer circles to refer to people who are not transgender or genderqueer. In other words, these are muggles. Next, there's transgender. This refers to people whose assigned or perceived gender at birth does not align with their internal experience of gender. Gender queer refers to people who consciously reject the idea that gender is a biological reality, instead framing it as entirely a social construct. Next we're going to discuss relationship styles. Monogamous relationships are when an individual has an exclusive, romantic, and sexual relationship with one person at a time. These are generally the most traditional relationships. You have a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a wife, a husband. They are the only individuals that you engage with sexually or romantically at a time. 
polyamorous relationship is when an individual can have multiple romantic and sexual relationships at a time. Everyone knows about the relationships. This is not cheating. They have different negotiated rules depending on the relationship. Generally, individuals in a polydynamic have an understanding that they will have to actually go through and define the rules that they and their partners are comfortable with. Just because someone is in a polyamorous relationship does not mean that they are free to screw around, as the saying goes. They may be in a committed poly relationship where they've negotiated that they are in a relationship with a fixed number of people and that is the completeness of the relationship unless they go and actually renegotiate boundaries but they may also be in a polyamorous relationship where things aren't necessarily so strict there isn't really one defined way to be in a polyamorous relationship then there are open relationships or closed relationships and again either monogamous or polyamorous relationship can be open or closed a closed relationship like i just described in the polyamorous context is one where you are only engaged sexually with individuals whom you are also romantically engaged in an open relationship there are the people you're in a relationship with that you're engaged with romantically but you may engage with other people sexually again generally in an open relationship there is some level of communication that's negotiated between the individuals in the relationship about how much they will or won't share about their extra sexual partners but there is some negotiated framework through which additional sexual partners beyond the romantic boundaries are acceptable ds refers to a dominant submissive relationship in these relationships one person has power over another this power is negotiated so on a certain level it's performative in most cases the individual who is submissive and there are a number of terms for submissive boy slave girl pup there are a number of different forms that this takes they always have the right to say no not right now if they don't have that right then it's not a ds relationship it is an abusive relationship the framework around that and how willing they are to execute that power may vary from relationship to relationship most ds relationships tend to be somewhat casual although some of them become very strong 24-hour intensive affairs and finally, we have a small selection of terms relating to queer experience that don't fit under a neat umbrella. The process of coming out can apply to either sex, gender, or any number of less traditional sexual relationship models. Coming out is a reference to coming out of the closet. You are considered to be in the closet if you are gay, bisexual, lesbian, trans, genderqueer, in a polyamorous relationship, in any of these sort of queer identity models, if they apply to you, but you hide that, you cover it, you're considered to be hiding in the closet. The act of coming out is the act of making those things visible to the rest of the world. While a lot of movies will make it seem like coming out is a thing, we have our coming out story and now you're out. The actual experience for most queer individuals is that coming out is a non-stop lifetime process because every time you meet a new person and it's not with your partner, it's not in an explicitly queer space, there is the automatic societal assumption that you are straight, that you are cisgendered, that you are monogamous. And so there's a constant process of oh hey I'm gay, oh hey I have multiple partners, oh by the way your understanding of my gender is probably a little too simplistic. And different people depending on which particular identity they have to come out about over and over again may do that constantly or may be very selective about it. At this point in our culture coming out as gay or lesbian is relatively easy coming out as bisexual is still considerably more complicated and for several bisexual individuals they may even be in the closet within queer spaces it may be easier for them to sort of identify or pretend to identify as gay or lesbian when they're in gay or lesbian spaces because in that space the assumed identity 
is gay or lesbian, and so they have to come out as bisexual. Um, when you get into gender, it gets even more complicated. So it is both a moment in your life where you begin to live whatever that particular truth is and have other people know about it in general, but it is also a constant process as you move into normative spaces, be it job or social spaces that aren't queer, and you have to bring that queerness with you and come out again over and over again. And that is what some small slice of coming out is. Ghettos, or gay ghettos as they're known, are areas of cities and population centers where gay people tend to congregate. Not all ghettos are focused specifically on gay men, although several of the most visible ones do tend to highlight their association with gay men. Uh, I personally live in Chicago, and I live in the northern edge of a cluster of neighborhoods that are known collectively as a gay toe. They are not all limited to gay men. Um, there's one particular neighborhood close to where I live that is actually known for having a very large lesbian population. Interestingly, within gay culture, different neighborhoods in this sort of block of space in Chicago are known for different sort of subcultures within the larger gay culture or within lesbian culture, queer culture broadly. So when you think of the Castro in San Francisco, um, there's a particular area in Indianapolis, which is close to where I'm from, that is known as being a gay neighborhood. You'll generally see a large concentration of gay bars, lesbian bars, queer spaces in a gay toe. And the whole idea is it's a space generally where you can go, you can identify, you won't have to, as I described earlier, come out constantly in those spaces. They tend to be very cultivated, and a lot of queer individuals will move to those spaces just because of the lower stress of being able to live more passively about their life and not having to assert it into whatever space they're in regularly. In that respect, that they're very much like living in a freehold. Cruising. Cruising is a phenomenon that is not limited to gay men by any means, but I can only really speak to as it relates to gay men. The culture of cruising used to be much stronger than it is today. Cruising was the idea that you could be walking in a public space or in a pseudo-public space and identify other gay men who might be interested primarily in sex. And there were a couple different ways that you could identify. You could make eye contact, you could wear certain articles of clothing, and that once that identifier had sort of been seen and recognized and certain signs were given, then you knew it was safe to pursue some sort of interaction. Maybe romantic, but in most cases it tended to just be sexual. Um, looking for a hookup is part of cruising culture, although now it's certainly been uh, integrated into more common parlance. There was sort of a ritual that I learned about cruising when I was first coming out. If you made eye contact with someone on the street and it lasted longer than was sort of the normally socially accepted norm and you passed them and you turned around and you looked back, if they also looked back at you, it was then safe to assume that they were probably cruising and they were probably gay because people just don't do that. And so there was just a set of behavioral patterns that were learned and passed on uh, somewhat informally for years among gay men that was specifically designed to help them find each other. Um, again, I have met several individuals in the queer community that are not gay men necessarily that engage in cruising, but it is most commonly known, um, especially its rise in popularity during the 70s after most of the anti-homosexual laws were dropped as having become very popular among gay men at that time and becoming a general social consciousness around gay male identity, but it is not limited to gay male identity. Gay voice is uh, the particular intonation and sounds in a voice that identify it as coming from a gay man. 
This is uh, difficult in a lot of ways. Gay voice has been co-opted in a lot of movies. It's used oftentimes to stereotype. But when you hang out with gay men, uh, especially certain cultures, actually amplifying gay voice, accentuating it intentionally, is not uncommon. Uh, drag queens will often do this in performances. There's a lot of performative aspect to this, to taking on an identity and projecting. Uh, this also gets back to the previous description I gave of coming out. If you have a predominantly gay voice, if you begin to dress in ways that are seen within the given time as being associated with lesbianness, gayness, queerness, then it alleviates the need to come out automatically. Depending on where you live, it may introduce other risk factors. But if you live and work in a relatively safe space, then there's a certain amount of unspoken advertising that gay voice is a part of to avoid the sort of awkward conversational coming out that has to happen if it isn't necessarily apparent to individuals that you meet that you are likely some identity of queer that you are advertising. Again, individuals from different parts of the LGBTQ queer community and spectrum may be more or less comfortable with that advertising process. Generally, the identities that are more accepted at this point in our society also come along with more comfort in advertising. It's easier to be very obviously gay than it is to be very obviously trans or be very obviously a non-binary gender queer trans individual. So all of these things get kind of messy, but that's the general concept behind the term. Uh -huh.